we probably should start keeping a running tally of conservation laws. Your textbook does cover this in some later section, but I think this is a good time to just to start listing everything we know are conserved. So if you are looking for it in your textbook, it should be somewhere here, uh, part particle conservation laws. So you can look at that there. But let's just start listing all the conservation laws we know, just so that we are sure that we are not violating any of them. Um, so the list of conservation laws. What are some things that you know are conserved? Energy and momentum, those are the two big ones. Those are sometimes known as two pillars of physics. So energy and momentum are conserved. Or if you are, um, if you are special relativity minded, then you could actually s combine this into one quantity and say that four momentum is conserved because these are the components of the, the four vector, that momentum. <laughs> uh, what else is conserved? Mass? Now, mass, it turns out, we can't say that is conserved. Because when you say mass is conserved, you're trying to say rest energy is conserved. And that's not quite right, right? We know interactions where rest energy goes into kinetic energy. So we won't say mass. So one thing I can say is that mass conservation is not held here, because, well, it's not conserved. <laughs> OK, what's conserved? Think there's one more quantity that you are supposed to know is conserved. Maybe you are not, oh, someone's. It's possible that you are not thinking of it as a conserved quantity because you think it sounds like one of the other quantities already there, but it's actually a separate quantity because the fundamental reason it's conserved is distinct from why any of these are conserved. You cover this in physics for A, actually. Yeah, angular momentum. And I know many of you are thinking of it as a separate thing, but momentum and angular momentum, I know they sound similar, but they are different. So we have to list angular momentum as a separate quantity that must be conserved. And this especially makes sense in the context of quantum mechanics, because spin is its own thing. Like spin has no linear momentum it's associated with. It's just an angular momentum that exists independently of momentum. And actually, I guess we are not going to spend much time on this. Each one of these um, conservation laws, they are associated with a natural symmetry that exists in nature. So there's, so you know, this gets too abstract, so I don't want to waste much time on it. But for those of you interested, Look up something called Noether's theorem. She was a mathematician. I don't know if she was, I want to say German, but I don't know. Well, OK, I don't know her nationality. But it's, a, it's a, a theorem proved by a mathematician who says every one of conserved quantities is a result of a symmetry in the physical system. So I will just uh, list the. The, the symmetries that are responsible for each of these being conserved. And uh, uh, I guess let me call it natural symmetry. So the symmetry that's associated with energy conservation is a symmetry with respect to time tra translation. You can think of it this way. The experiment that you do today if you did it tomorrow, you should still get the same result. That, so that's what we mean. We have time translational symmetry. When you translate a system in time, nothing changes. So that's directly related to energy being conserved. Momentum is associated with um, spatial, trans, um, spatial translation. So in fact, you can kind of see one of the, some of the systems you have seen. So if you have a, a cart that's just rolling on a flat ground, momentum is conserved in this system, right? What kind of change can you make to this system to uh, make it so that momentum of this cart is not conserved? What change can you make? 
Any change? You could, add, yeah, you can add a friction, but it's hard to address that in a symmetric way. Um, so the <laughs> easiest way to do it, add an incline. Then once you have an incline, it's no longer uh, symmetric with respect to a translation in horizontal direction because as you go, the height changes. So when you break the symmetry, then the, the horizontal momentum is no longer conserved. So, um, so that's what's associated with the momentum. Any guesses what symmetry is associated with angular momentum conservation? What kind of uh, operation, what transformation that a system must be symmetric with respect to that would lead to angular momentum conservation? Something radial, right? Now, do, would you want it to be synced going like a movement radially outward or movement kind of in a tangential direction, a kind of rotation? Tangential, yeah. So angular momentum is associated with rotational symmetry. Um, or symmetry, I guess, with respect to, I, I should uh, um, <laughs> conjugate, conjugate? Not conjugate. Uh, well, use proper conjunctional relationships. <laughs> so symmetry with respect to rotation. I guess just, I could say angular rotation, but I think when you say rotation, angular is implied. <laughs> um, so this, these are very common symmetries in nature. In fact, if you take the universe as a, if you take laws of physics as a whole, these are obeyed every single time. When you take a look at like a Newton's law, uh, when you translate the system with respect to time, Newton's law doesn't change. Same thing with the spatial translation, same thing with the rotation. Uh, when you look at any kind of expressions for kinetic energy, all these are held. And that's what results in, um, those symmetries result in these conservation laws. Um, all right, so those are the big three that you already know. There are actually more that I think you can kind of guess at it. If you have, there's at least one more that you should be able to guess or remember, maybe. One more quantity that's conserved. Electric charge? Yeah, electric charge. So charge is the other big quantity that's conserved. And I won't name, uh, charge? Uh, yeah, uh, let me specify electric charge. So electric charge is the other big quantity that's conserved. And as for the symmetry, which is associated with this, I think that it's a gauge transformation symmetry. I won't get to that because we haven't talked about, you know, <laughs> um, uh, vector potential in electro <laughs> electromagnetism. Um, but there is some symmetry that's associated with charge conservation. So these are the four big conservation laws that you already know. And based on this, I can tell you that this particular Feynman diagram is impossible. Because um, whatever this is, um, all those four conservation laws have to be obeyed. Um, so energy and momentum conservation, am I going to get in trouble with any of those or am I fine? Like in this interaction, so energy conservation is probably okay. I can just make sure that this has correct mass. Uh, momentum conservation, am I okay with that? Um, well, we can consider a special reference frame. So one easy reference frame to use is the center of momentum reference frame where this particle will be at rest. Now, can you imagine an arrangement of photons that will conserve the total momentum? Right? Head-on collision, equal energy, so momentum adds up to zero. So you have start out with the zero momentum here, end with the zero momentum here, you will be fine, right? Okay, I can conserve energy and momentum. Angular momentum, let's say, yeah, we can satisfy that. Um, the problem is electric charge conservation. So according to that fourth conservation law, what must be the charge of this particle? Zero, all right, so maybe you think, oh, so that's fine, we'll, we'll just have this charge be, this particle have zero charge. Then there's a very subtle problem with this diagram. Anyone guess at the problem that I'm hinting at? It's not that obvious. Uh, you kind of need to have it pointed out to you. 
um, it comes down to that Feynman diagrams are supposed to represent, ooh, represent interactions. Okay, so if your interacts, if your interaction involves a photon, what kind of interaction are we talking about? What kind of forces are involved in this interaction? What is a photon at its very nature? Yeah, electromagnetic wave. So if you have a photon involved, then what this means is this is some kind of electromagnetic interaction. Okay, what physical quantity do you need in order to have electromagnetic interaction? Okay, you, you can, so what photon actually represents is electric field. So if you have electric field, what else must do you have? Okay, you can also represent the magnetic field, all right, but okay, let me change the question. If you have electric field, where did it come from? What produces electric field? Yeah, electric charge. So to produce electric field, you need electric charge. And if you have electric field in empty space, like nothing would ever happen there. For the electric field to interact with something, exert a force, what do you need? Like what kind of objects do electric fields exert a force on? On electric charges. So if it's an electromagnetic interaction, it requires charge, requires charge Q. So if this hypothetical particle um, was a charge neutral particle as conservation law requires, then this interaction couldn't happen in the first place because, um, because the photon wouldn't interact with a chargeless particle. So that's what I mean, this is kind of a fraudulent diagram. It's a diagram that actually doesn't exist. And I guess that's a problem with anything that's uh, hypothetical because you are um, drawing diagrams based on things that may not exist. So the diagram you end up drawing might be something that doesn't exist in the first place. 